Yes. All right. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn to, uh, let's just look at a couple of different passages. If you'll turn to 2 Timothy and 2 Peter, and then we're going to look at a bunch of seconds today. So we're going to look at 2 Timothy, 2 Peter, and then 2 Samuel. You, you'll, you'll catch on as we go through today. All right. How's that? We're talking today about the word of God. And uh, I, I don't know that we have a more important treasure here on earth. And I get, other than the Holy Spirit himself, the word of God is, should be special to every one of us. And yet we're kind of living in a time and a society today where the word of God seems to be, um, people are misinterpreting it. People are making it into what they want to hear. Uh, they're actually now there's something known as deconstructionism. If you don't know, if you're not familiar with that, but they're ta- trying to take the word of God and they're trying to deconstruct the word of God and the meaning behind it. And let me just say to you, this word does not change. It must remain the same. Now, I want to, you know, for some of you, some of your guests who are here with us today, let me just say to you, uh, church today for you might be way different than what you're used to. Okay, listen, the message of the word of God stays the same, no matter what, stays the same. The methods that we use, that we employ to reach people may change. God never said how, what the methods are supposed to be, but he did tell us the message of the word of God has to remain the same. So I want to talk about the word of God today, and I've got two basic areas that I want to talk about. I'm going to start with this, and that is how do we know that God's word is actually from God himself? How do we know that God's word is not just written by a bunch of men? How do, how do we know? And by the way, men did pen it, but God inspired it. In other words, they were just secretaries writing down what God told them to write down. Well, how do we know that? So I want to kind of give you uh, three points about how we know that God's word is actually legitimate. It literally is from God himself. And I think if we can understand that it really is from God, then we'll treasure it more. We'll find it more special to ourselves. So, uh, so here's the first point, and that is the scripture... Here's how we know that it's God's word, uh, that it's from him himself. The scriptures say so. The word of God say so. And I know for some of you, you're going to be like, well, I, I don't know if that's really a big proof, but you need to know that the word of God says that he wrote it. He, you need to know that. Let me just show you some verses real quick. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, all scripture is God breathed. Some translations say it's God inspired. I, I'm saying, what he's saying is literally, when you, when you speak, you cannot speak without breath coming out. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, if I'm gonna talk to you, I, don't, I can't talk and suck in. I have to talk and blow out across the vocal cords. You understand that? Here's what he's saying, that God literally spoke this word and men wrote it down. Another passage of scripture, 2 Peter, if you're looking, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says, excuse me, verse 20 says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture Again, when we talk about prophecy in scripture, we're literally talking about the word of God, the words that are written in scripture. No prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. In other words, when we look at the word of God, when we look at scripture, the prophecies of God's word, literally they're just writing down what God had to say. Second Samuel, Old Testament verse, uh, second Samuel chapter 23, verse one says, these are the last words of David. I want you to think about David. Uh, David is responsible for writing the vast majority of the Psalms that we have, not all of them, but the vast majority of the Psalms were written by David. And David was a king, uh, but David in some places, he acted as a priest. And you'll have to go and study that to see that. So here is David who's king, and, and a couple of times he acts as priest in the temple. It says, these are the last words of David, the inspired utterance of David. I want you to notice that what David uttered, the words that came out of David's mouth were inspired of the, he says, the, uh, the inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the most high, the man anointed by God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. 
Here's, here's what David said. This is the last things that David said. The spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. Did, did you catch that? The, would you say the last thing that you say might be important? David said, I just want you to know, some of you think it was me. Some of you, you're gonna, some of you are gonna venerate me as king. But the reality is, I only said what I heard my savior say. I only, heard, I only said what I heard my God say. The spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. I literally just let it roll off my tongue because it was God who gave these things to me. So the word of God says so. How else do we know that this, that this word is from God himself? So let me give you a second proof, and I think this is even more of a proof, that I think if you're not convinced yet, you should be convinced when we hit this one. Here, and here it is. Because of the fulfillment of scripture, uh, listen, I, there's, you know, you, there are prophecies in the Quran. Uh, there are prophecies uh, in the Book of Mormon, but they are not inspired of God. And those prophecies, you know, you know, I could tell you enough stuff that maybe one of those things comes true. But here's what we know about the Quran. Here's what we know about the Book of Mormon. Here's what we know about all other writings is that not all of their prophecies have come true and will not come true. But what about just the prophecies in the Bible that talk about Jesus, the Messiah, coming? Uh, and and what's, what about, uh, what if there are prophecies in the Bible, hundreds of them, what if there are prophecies about Jesus and what are, what's the potential that Jesus will fulfill every one of them? So I'm gonna give you 51 prophecies, so write them down fast, <laughs> that reveal the one that revealed Jesus. We, I gave you this, some, if you, some of you were here, I gave some of these before, I gave them back at Christmas time last year, but this is just so powerful, I wanted to bring it back to you again and see it. So 51 prophecies that reveal the one. Okay, here's, here's, here's the first one. Messiah would bless the nations through Abraham's lineage in Genesis 12. Mes, uh, number two, Messiah will make covenant with Isaac's ancestors in Genesis 17. Messiah's scepter will come through Judah in Genesis 49. Messiah would come through David's offspring in 2 Samuel chapter seven. Messiah would come through a virgin and will be called Emmanuel in Isaiah chapter seven. Uh, the Messiah will end up in Egypt in Hosea chapter 11. The Messiah will be born in Bethlehem in Micah chapter five. Uh, Messiah's ministry will destroy the devil's work in Genesis chapter three. By the way, all of these prophecies that I just gave you happened over 400 years before Jesus shows up on the scene. Now that's just eight of them, but what are, what are the odds that Jesus fulfilled, one, or let me say it another way, what are the odds that any one person in humanity could ever fulfill all eight of those written about them? Just eight, just eight. I mean, just, tiny, just a tiny part of the prophecies about Jesus. What are the odds? Well, it would be one in 10 to the 17th power. To help you with that, that would be a one with 17 zeros behind it. Now, let, let, me make, let me bring that home to you a little bit. I just noticed uh, this week as I was reading uh, some news this week, I guess the lottery just hit an all-time high. Have y'all been noticing that? I'm, I don't want to ask how many of you bought tickets. I'm guessing quite a few of you because it's pretty high. One, uh, $1.6 billion. That, that's a lot. Okay, let me help you with your odds of winning it. One single person winning it. What's the odds that one person... One single person would win that, okay? It would be one in 30 to the eighth power. That would be a three with eight zeros behind it. For Jesus to fulfill just these eight, it's a one with 17 zeros behind it. I'm, I'm just telling you how it just, it's, we're getting, we're moving to the place where it would be almost nearly impossible for any one person to ever fulfill just eight. But that's not all he fulfilled. Uh, number nine, Messiah would have a sinless, blemish-free life in ministry in Exodus 12. Messiah will be humbled in order to serve mankind in Psalms 8. Messiah would become the perfect sacrifice in Psalms 40. And also in Psalm 40, Messiah would preach righteousness to Israel. Psalm 78 says the Messiah would teach in parables. Isaiah 6 says the Messiah's parables would fall on death's ear. Messiah would be, stone, uh, would be a stone that causes people to stumble in Isaiah 8. 
Isaiah 9 says Messiah's ministry will begin in Galilee. Now that's 16. Are y'all following this? By the way, everything that we're mentioning here, Jesus did. He fulfilled all of these. Uh, number 17, the Messiah would draw the Gentiles to himself in Isaiah 11. In, in Isaiah 35, the Messiah would have a miraculous ministry. How many of you would agree that Jesus performed miracles? Isaiah 40, the Messiah would be preceded by a forerunner. That would be John the Baptist. Uh, Malachi 4 says the Messiah's forerunner would come in the spirit of Elijah. Many people said about John the Baptist. Who did you, he, Jesus said, Why, who did you go out to see? Some say Elijah. <laughs> I just want you to get that, in the spirit of Elijah. Isaiah 42, the Messiah will be a gentle redeemer of the Gentiles. How many of you are glad for that? Because he didn't just come for the Jews, he came to seek all who were lost. Thank, thank you, Lord. Isaiah 53 says the Messiah would be despised and rejected. Well, we know that happened. Isaiah 61, the Messiah will set captives free. Daniel 7, the Messiah will have a throne that is everlasting. Daniel 9, the Messiah will bring an end to sin. Zechariah 9 says, Jerusalem will rejoice that the Messiah comes to her upon a donkey. Are y'all following this? I mean, I'm just saying the odds of this happening are infinitesimal. Uh, Psalm 31, they would plot to kill God's Messiah. In Zechariah 11, the Messiah will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. In Psalm 38, the Messiah will be quiet before his accusers. Psalm 31 and Psalm 41 both say that Messiah will be abandoned by those closest to him. Exodus 12 says the Messiah will be our Passover lamb. Like the Passover lamb, none of the Messiah's bones will be broken, found in Exodus 12. Isaiah 50 says the Messiah will be mocked and abused. Psalm 22 says they will cast lots for the Messiah's clothing. Leviticus 17 says the Messiah's blood will be spilt for atonement. Numbers 21 says the Messiah will be lifted up and everyone who looks on him will live. Psalm 69 says the Messiah's thirst will be quenched with vinegar and gall. Psalm 22 says the Messiah would be forsaken. Psalm 22 also says the Messiah would be scorned. Also, by the way, if you want to read a good passage of just constant prophetic things, Psalm 22. Psalm 22 also says Messiah's suffering would include thirst. It says they would pierce Messiah's hands and his feet. Psalm 31 says the Messiah will cry, into your hands I commit my spirit. Job 19 and Psalms 118, the Messiah's resurrection was prophesied. In Psalm chapter 16, God's Messiah will not see decay because he was resurrected. Uh, Jeremiah 31 says the Messiah will usher in a new covenant. Uh, Psalm 68 says the Messiah will ascend into heaven to distribute gifts. Psalm 9 says the Messiah will judge the world justly. If you're trying to keep track, we're at 48. Uh, let me help you with that. Uh, it, the odds of Jesus fulfilling just 48 of, of the prophecies of the Old Testament, just one person somewhere in history could even fulfill all of these 48 will be one in 10 to the 157th power. Scientists today tell us that when we do odds, that anything that's higher than one in 10 to the 50th power is impossible. Let me, let me say that again. One in 10 to the 157th power. Jesus is the God of the impossible. He can do it. We're not done. Isaiah 22 says the Messiah will have all authority over judgment. Isaiah 44 says the Messiah will pour out his spirit. By the way, what we're seeing today, when we see the church, when we see the people of God, the reason we're all here today is because he poured out his spirit on Amen. all mankind. Both men and women, the Bible says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, the word of God says. That is being fulfilled today. We live in that day today. Micah 5 says the Messiah will have a worldwide impact. Praise the Lord. 51 reasons to prove to you he's the one and why we can believe that the word of God is actually the word of God. Are y'all with me on that? Okay, here's the third reason that we can believe that the word of God is actually from God, that God wrote it. And that is because of the eyewitnesses. Now, I just, I, again, many, many eyewitnesses, but you know, uh, if I wanted to tell a really good fib, 
You know, I, wanna, I would want to make sure that I told that fib when people who were, lived in that time did not know about it. Would, would you agree with that? Um, you know, I, uh, so I actually, I can tell you several, we moved to, we moved to Washington, D.C., uh, talking about lies. Anyway, so we moved to Washington, D.C. for nine, we lived in Washington, D.C. for nine and a half years. And uh, in that time frame, I got to, I got to, as a kid, a little boy, I got to shake. I mean, it's not a great big thing, honestly. I mean, I look back saying he wasn't that great of a man. But anyway, got to shake President Jimmy Carter's hand while he was president of the United States as a little boy. Actually, um, got to shake uh, Rosalind Carter's hand and, and uh, Michelle, my sister, who's, she's right over there. See her right over there? That's Michelle. Uh, Michelle, we had just gotten an ice cream cone and she shook their hand too. So it was awesome <laughs> as the secret service were reaching for hankies to wipe. Anyway, so, uh, but then I, we also lived in Washington DC when Ronald Reagan was president. We, we lived in Washington DC when Ronald Reagan was shot. Uh, I remember watching his, him being shot. We were watching TV. Of course, back then, you know, uh, we didn't have like 157 channels. So, you know, we had like, uh, you know, Six. I'm trying to remember, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC. I don't even think there was Fox at that point. I'm not sure. There might not have been Fox yet. And then PBS. I think that was like it. But anyway, you know, so, you know, whatever was happening is what you watched at that time. I remember watching when President Reagan was shot. Okay, uh, I, re- I remember it being a 22 caliber pistol. How many of you know it was a 22 caliber pistol that shot? Let me see your hand if you knew that. Okay, how do you know? Because many of us saw it. So I can tell that story while there's still people alive and you're going to go, yep, that's right. What pastor's saying is right. Okay. Because of eyewitnesses' accounts while people were still living, when they claimed that certain things happened, you can believe them. Because there were a lot of people alive when they started telling the stories about it and no one came out going, no, that's not true. No one. Okay, watch this. Let me just show it to you. Second Peter, I told you we're doing a lot of seconds today. Second Peter chapter one, verse 16 says, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. First Corinthians 15, verse three says, for I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He says, and that he was buried that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now pause right there. Okay, this is incredible statements that they're making. Many people saw that he died, but they're claiming that he died, he was buried, and he was raised. Listen, if, if it's only one person claiming it, or if it's only the 12 and they've created this huge conspiracy that he's alive, okay, what would be their gain? in telling it. By the way, let me just tell you what their gain was. They were persecuted, they were stoned, uh, they were crucified, they were tortured, all because they said that he was resurrected. Okay, by the way, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then what we believe in today is worthless. So we better find out if this resurrection thing is real or not. Because if it's real, then we have to believe it. And if we believe it, everything else the word of God tells us is true too. We need to believe it too. So watch this, verse four, verse five. And, he, and that he, after being resurrected, he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12. Verse six, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. They're just saying, you know, there were a few who died since then. This is probably written somewhere around, I think around 80, 60 to 80, 70. This is a very short period of time, maybe 30 years after Jesus was on the scene. And Paul says over 500 people, most of whom are still alive. A few have died, but most are still alive and they can verify that he was still alive. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, he he appeared to me, Paul. 
I saw him. He is alive. He is not dead. Paul, who persecuted the church because of people who said that they believed in the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says, I don't believe it. And he even had some killed, put in prison because of it. And then Jesus appeared to him and he decided, I better start believing the other way. Oh, James. He says he appeared to James. Did y'all catch that one? Who's James? Okay, you got to catch this. He's the half brother of Jesus. I don't, I don't have a step brother, but I have a brother. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that I could not convince my brother of a lie. There's a little sibling rivalry that always goes around by, by brothers, right? You know, it'd be like this. You know you're lying about that. That never happened. James is like, I'll back you up on this one. My brother was, was more than just my brother. He was resurrected from the dead and he's alive today. You've got to catch that. We have good reason to, to stand on the word of God and what it says to us. I want you to know that. So it's God's word. So here's the question, the second part of my message, and that is, then why should we study God's word? Because listen, if this really is God's word, don't you think this ought to be precious to us? I'm talking about from Genesis to Revelation. I'm talking about all the way through God's word. Is it precious to you? So why should we study this word? I mean, I've got two simple points. Number one, because we live in the last days. I'm convinced we live in the last days. And if we're living in the last days, then we need to prepare ourselves. Daniel chapter 12, verse four says, but as for you, Daniel wrote a lot about the last days. He says, Daniel can seal these words, seal up the book until the end of time. In other words, you know, when you read Daniel, you go, I don't, I don't really understand this. I don't really get what it's trying to say. God says, I want you to write it down so that people will have it uh, and, and seal it up until the end of time. He goes on to say, many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Let me help you with that. He says, in the last days, many people will be able to go there and here. They'll go back and forth and knowledge will increase. That's how you'll know when it's the last days. I literally left on a plane early Thursday morning, traveled all the way to St. Louis, back on Friday morning and was home by noon on Friday. Many will go back and forth. I, I just want you to catch this. It wasn't too many years ago that just going to Dallas would have been hard from here. It's not hard. I mean, many of you drive back and forth to Dallas every week. He says the time of the end, you'll know people will go here and there. It'll be real easy for them to go back and forth. And knowledge will increase. Well, you know, this is, this is my Bible that I hold and hold dear and special to me. I've got a lot of notes in it. And when I'm writing sermons, I go through and I look at the different things that I've written in it. But here's what's really cool. This is the Bible I'm using now. Knowledge has increased. Uh, I could actually pull up for you every sermon that I have written since, let me think here, 2009, I believe it is. They're all right here on this iPad. Every sermon since 2009 are right here on this iPad because we have the ability for knowledge to increase. Here's the real problem at the end of time. Knowledge increases, but the Bible doesn't say that wisdom will increase. We get smarter and stupider at the same time because we think we're smarter than God. And the reality is none of us are smarter than God. We need him. And by the way, if we need him, then we need to hear what he says. Do you agree? And if we're gonna hear what he has to say, we better know what he said. Because you'll never know what his voice sounds like without the word of God. We're living in the last days. Here's the second reason why we should study God's word. To be, to avoid being deceived. To avoid being deceived. I, I know a lot of people think, well, I'll never be deceived, pastor. I can't, I, I'm not gonna be deceived. I, I was counseling a couple, like you guys have heard this story before, but I was counseling a couple many years ago and they were sitting in my office 
And uh, I said, they said something. It was just a very deceptive statement. And I mean, they were, there weren't many things by, by it. They weren't trying to be, they weren't mean people. They weren't ugly people, but they, they made this statement to me. I said, you know, honestly, what you're saying right now about your marriage, about your home, you're deceived. And here was their statement to me. We're not deceived. If we were deceived, we'd know it. That's the definition of deception. You won't know it. You're deceived. Other people can see it in you. So someone says, well, how do I avoid that trap? Because the reality is every one of us could be deceived. I want you to get that. So how do we avoid being deceived? Okay, real simple. The way you avoid being deceived is to get into God's word, know God's word, study God's word, show your, study to show thyself approved. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I, it helps me to know what my next step is, what my next direction is. I need God's word in my life. The word of God will help you from being deceived. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, the shepherd of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. In other words, there are deceivers who will come right into the church. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. We, well, we live in that day. We live in that day and time where perverse things are being spoken by, in some cases, church leaders. Uh, you'll hear me say this over and over again. Listen, I do my very best to bring to you a message from God's word, truth from God's word. But listen to me. Don't just take my word for it. Get into the word of God and see if what I'm saying is truth. You say, well, pastor, I just believe that you'll, you'll always tell the truth. Well, that, that's my goal. My goal is always to tell you the truth. But the reality is, what happens when I'm gone? What happens when someone else steps in this platform from some time to the next time and they're not preaching the truth and you just go, well, amen. Well, just amen. Do you know that's happening all across our nation right now? People are just saying amen to things that aren't truth. Well, the only way you're gonna be able to avoid that is to be in God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 says, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's gonna get worse. So why do I bring a message like this? Because I want you to be in God's word. I want you to know God's word. I don't want you to know God's word because you came to a message, to a sermon, and you heard it. That's great. But you need to know God's word. You need to be in God's word. And God's word needs to be precious to you. It's, we call this the Holy Bible. It's precious. Many years ago, my dad uh, had a chance to go to Russia and uh, went with some prominent men. And uh, they, you know, they decided they were gonna try and go in and take Bibles to the Russians. Now this is all before the Iron Curtain fell. And so they were over there in Russia, and so they had to sneak Bibles in. That was the only way they were going to be able to, to bring Bibles into the country. And so my dad was a big man. He was six foot seven, like 250 pounds or something, big guy. And so they were all coming in. They all had suitcases. They had a suitcase with their clothes in it and had a suitcase with Bibles in it. Every one of them were coming in that way. And of course, you know, you have to go through customs, just like you do here in the United States. Well, you know, so my dad... Uh, no one was really, plan no one planned it out. No one was trying to plan anything out. They weren't really even trying to hide it that much. So they come in, and so my dad happened to be at the front of the line with all these other pastors, and so they kind of spread out through customs there. And as my dad would tell the story, he said they get up there and they open his suitcase and it's full of Bibles. And of course, they started saying, oh no, you can't do this. You can't bring these Bibles in. And my dad started throwing a fit. These are my Bibles. You can't take my Bibles. These are, I'm going to bring bringing these Bibles in. No, no, you can't bring these Bibles in. You know, and you know, he goes, and then they started trying to take his Bibles. No, no, and he starts throwing this big hissy fit in front of all the Russians that were there. And uh, so while he's throwing this fit, all the other agents, they're watching to see what's this big dude about to do over there, you know? So, you know, they're unzipping suitcases and, okay, you can go. Okay, okay, you can go. Everybody else got their Bibles in except for my dad. My dad, he did convince them that they could, he could bring his personal Bible. You can, you can have your personal, you can only bring it. That's the only thing you can bring. You bring your personal Bible. And of course, you know, if, if you've had a Bible for a long time, you've got lots of notes and things that you've written in on the pages of that Bible. And that's the way my dad's Bible was. 
And so he goes in and, you know, they speak at different places while they're there in Russia. And they got the privilege to go to a wedding. And uh, this man and his wife, or this bride of this man were being married. And my dad was sitting there holding his Bible. And he said, the Holy Spirit just spoke to him and said, I want you to give your Bible to that groom. I want you to give your Bible to that groom. And they're at the front, they're at the altar. And, you know, he's, he's got a grip on his bride. His bride has a grip on him. And dad can't get to the front because the church that they're in is completely full of people. So he just takes his Bible and has the translator pass it up. And they finally pass it through everyone and gave it to the groom, you know? And my dad, as he tells a story, says that that groom took that Bible. And as soon as he realized it was a gift for him, that it was his gift, he let go of his bride because they couldn't have Bibles. And he gripped that Bible because it was so special to him, so precious to him. Well, I wonder how many Americans that we have three Bibles each or five Bibles or 10 Bibles and not one of them is special to us. The living, breathed word of God. Here's what I'm trying to get you to do. I want you to make a commitment that between now and the end of the year, you'll make a decision to begin to hold God's word as special, special in your home, special in your daily reading, that you would read it. Right now I'm reading through Jeremiah, it's so powerful. I mean, I, I think I'm getting more out of Jeremiah this time than I've ever gotten out. I've read it I don't know how many times in my life. I'm reading through Jeremiah right now, it's so powerful because it's special to me. And I want God's word to be that special to you. Can I pray for you? Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? We like to ask this question at the end of every message. What is God telling you right now? Would you ask him? How is your time with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Is it special? Is it precious? Now I want to ask one last question. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I don't know this Jesus, this Savior that you're talking about, but I'd sure like to. I've never heard that God's word was so real. But I want this Jesus in my life. And I want to make him Lord of my life. If you're here today and you've never invited Christ into your heart, you can do it right now. It's, it's free. It came from him. He, he died for this. All you have to do is right where you're seated, you can pray a prayer like this. You can say, dear Lord Jesus, I confess before you that I'm a sinner and that I need a savior in my life. Jesus. I surrender myself to you. I give you my life. From this day forward, I belong to you and you to me. Thank you, Father, for giving us Jesus. Thank you, Father, for offering your son as a sacrifice for my sins. And thank you, Father, for raising him from the dead. In Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that or something similar to that where you're inviting Jesus to come be a part of your life, to be Lord of your life, take a moment just to say thank you. Just tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. We're gonna sing one last song in just a moment. I'm gonna pray before we do. And if you need prayer for any reason, we believe in a God who's still in the miracle working business who heals homes and marriages, who, who heals physical ailments. We want to pray for you. And I want to encourage you, if you need prayer for any reason, maybe you invited Jesus in your heart this morning for the first time, I want to invite you, come. Come to the front, put your hand in someone's hand and say, hey, pray for me, pray for my situation, pray for my circumstances. 
And if you did invite Jesus in your heart, as you put your hand in someone's hand, we want to give you, if you don't have a Bible, we want to put a, the word of God in your hand today. Just say, hey, can I have a Bible? We'll be glad to give you the word of God today before you leave. Just come and tell someone, I need Jesus. I pray to receive Jesus. Whatever it is you need prayer for, we want to invite you to come. Father God, we love you. We bless your holy name. For you are great and greatly to be praised. And you are worthy of all of our worship. Thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us alone, but you gave us the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Father, we can recognize the Holy Spirit through the words that are on your pages of the book that you gave us. Help us to hold it precious. Help us to hold it close. We surrender our lives before you. Here is where I lay it down. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord.